Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight for the last performance in context of the season. I'm so pleased to have uh, Dr. Madrid, uh, Alejandra Madrid, whose recent book on Tanya Leon came out this last fall. It's a fascinating book. If you get a chance, you ought to see if you can get a copy of it. Um, you will notice if you go to our website that we have an archive. All of our uh, previous interviews are all up there. And so if you've missed any of the performance and context interviews, I encourage you to go and look through our list and see if anything piques your interest. All right, thank you for joining me, Alejandro. I'm so pleased to have you here. Um, your, your book is entitled uh, Tanya Leon Stride, A Polyrhythmic Life, and it was published by University of Illinois Press, as I understand, um, and you were recently named a 2022 Fellow of the John Simone Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, so congratulations on that. Thank you, thank you, and thanks for the invitation. It really is a pleasure to be here and, and to talk about such a, a dear uh, artist as uh, uh, Tanya Leon. Yeah, I was especially interested. We, we um, had on our series, uh, one of the quartets played her first string quartet and um, it's marvelous. People told me that they went back and looked at the recording of that concert and listened to it over and over. They, they were moved enough by it. So I'm really glad we get to talk about her tonight. Um, I want to start first with um, what a musicologist is. You are a musicologist. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, um, formally I'm a musicologist. Um, what musicologists do basically is uh, they study um, the history or the anthropology of music. So um, how is it that music has been used by humanity in the history of humanity uh, to express to reflect on uh, 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 on their lives, um, but, but also to build community, uh, to develop senses of identity. Um, so uh, basically, musicologists are historians of music or anthropologists of music. Um, I do both. I do anthropology of music and I do also mu uh, music history. Um, and as an anthropologist, I'm also concerned with some of these issues of um, identity construction, um, how is it that we um, come up with ideas of what is valuable in, in, in music? So what are the criteria that, that for, for uh, people to consider something to be good music or bad music? Uh, and how um, those criteria and those values s uh, say something about us as, you know, uh, as a society in this particular moment in, in time. So it's, uh, it's um, musicology sort of, uh, sort of a very interdisciplinary field that includes sociology, history, anthropology, um, and uh, I, uh, and also music theory. So, and mm -hmm. I feel that what I do is sort of crosses all of the, these different boundaries. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really fascinating. Um, do you do you have a particular region or time period that your work is focused on? Yeah. So the region is basic, uh, mostly uh, Latin American and. Uh, uh, and also the United States, so uh, mostly uh, Latino communities in the United States, 19th century, 20th century, and uh, you know the first 20 years of the 21st century. So yeah, basically from the uh, mid uh, 1800s to the present, that's, that's the kind of work that I do. So yeah, historical and also ethnographic. Mm -hmm. So I, I read your book. Um, and one of the things that I thought was fascinating, something I just hadn't even thought about, was how active the musical community was in Cuba pre-revolution, um, pre and then how it changed but was also active post-revolution. I wonder if you could sort of um, create a picture for us of what was going on. And this would have been, um, so Tanya Leon was 10 when, when the revolution occurred? Uh, she was a little bit older. So Tanya, Tanya was born in 1943 and the revolution, so the triumph of the revolution is in 1959. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, she was 19, closer to that, uh, 17 maybe. Uh, and um, so uh, the 
you know the the first maybe 10 years of, of Daniel Leon's life uh, took place in the in the 1940s, who, which was a moment of um, um, a relative econo uh, uh, bo economic boom in Cuba. Uh, it was a democratic era. Um, uh, you know, there was a, the constitution that was uh, signed in 1940 that was very progressive. Uh, but all of this came to an end uh, in um, um, 19, say, um, what, 1952, where there was a coup d'etat and, and Fulgencio Batista became uh, 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 the dictator of, 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 uh, of the country. And he implemented a very author authoritarian regime. Uh, um, uh, and eventually, even though it was supported by the United States, eventually, um, he uh, there was the economy sort of stagnated, and it became a problem. So it was sort of that that those uh, seven years right before uh, 1959 that were sort of the moment when uh, um, uh, the um, animosity of the people of Cuba uh, sort of fueled what the revolution was, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, um, and that was, uh, there was a big music scene uh, uh, in Cuba in the 1950s uh, of composers who were mostly uh, composing music of what we would consider a sort of neoclassical style. So they would borrow from forms and, 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 and music traditions that uh, emulated Baroque, uh, um, Baroque techniques and Baroque styles in a more sort of modern uh, 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 setting. Um, the Grupo de Renovación was the, probably the most important uh, um, group of composers, uh, and Jose, Jose Ardebol was really the most important uh, teacher who was actually creating this school. Um, uh, and um, there were many composers who were already interested in sort of borrowing from um, a folk and um, popular music tradition from Cuba, um, but they were uh, doing it in within sort of this uh, very sort of neoclassical uh, language, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, and some of these composers uh, uh, remain active after the 1959 revolution, um, but the, the scene starts changing definitely, uh, especially uh, because of the relationship with uh, with Poland and the, the the young Cuban composers who were sent by uh, by the Cuban government to uh to the uh, warsaw autumn uh, uh festival mm -hmm. in, in poland and they were there uh in very influenced by the by the avant-garde the european avant-garde um so a new a more avant-garde more experimental um scene is developed in the 1960s and, and it's really that's sort of the most um uh the most promising moment of the revolution or the revolution happened there was there was a lot of people uh, uh, who were actually welcoming they welcomed the changes um and they slowly became as, as the decade passed uh, and uh, uh, as as the uh, as the 1970s approach and the, the big changes that happened in the 1970s in cuba were basically the uh, stalinization of, of of the of politics and the economy um, so uh, as, as, as this, uh, this shift happened, people became more and more uh, um, uh, concerned with what was happening in Cuba. But that early moment of the, the early 1960s, that was a moment of uh, a lot of um, um, uh, activity, cultural activity, musical activity, and especially with these composers who are trying to create a, 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 an avant-garde scene in, in mm -hmm. Cuba. Tanya Leung was very young at the time. She graduated in 1960 from um, from uh, the conservatory, and um, so uh, she um, she had a very sort of traditional training. Um, uh, she studied in a private school uh, in in Cuba. And I have some images here that I may wanna I may wanna share just to illustrate some of these ideas that I'm that I'm uh, telling you about. Um, so this is a picture of um, actually the uh, the diploma of, of uh, Tania's uh, uh, so his undergraduate diploma from 1960. Uh, she got a degree uh, in music theory and a degree in piano. So she was a pianist. 
and um, she became active in the scene, uh, mostly as someone who was trying to um, um, further develop uh, her piano technique. Um, as I mentioned, her training at this conservatory was sort of very, very traditional. Uh, she learned, it was a conservatory that was based on the uh, pedagogical techniques uh, that came from Europe, basically from France mostly, um, uh, that were very strong, a very, very, very solid uh, theoretical background in terms of harmony, counterpoint, solfege, uh, and basic piano technique. Uh, and she knew all of the European classics, basically. This is what she was training. Uh, with, the, uh, with the addition of the sort of the Cuban uh, masters, uh, especially those uh, 19th century and early 20th century uh, piano composers who had composed uh, counter dances and, and uh, habaneras and this type of music that was considered sort of the, the national music uh, mm -hmm. of Cuba. Um, so this is sort of the scene that 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 that, uh, that she uh, came into the, uh, uh, the the early 1960s. She was also very interested in um, uh, in getting an understanding of what popular music in Cuba was. So uh, in um, 19 so 1964, she joined the uh, the popular Cuban uh, popular Cuban music seminar, which was a class that was created by uh, uh, Odilio Orfe, a very famous musicologist in Cuba. Um, and this class basically uh, was um, targeting musicians who uh, didn't have a popular musicians who were already active in the popular music scene, but who didn't have a uh, a thorough uh, uh, um, training uh, theoretical training in music. Um, uh, she joined this school, this school because she wanted to learn about musical, uh, uh, popular music practice, and she studied piano there with um, with uh, um, Jesus Lopez, who was actually a danzón pianist. Who he, he played danzones and uh, popular sort of you know, cha 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 and mambo, this kind of music, uh, in a very very uh, famous orchestra from the from the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, Arcaño y sus maravillas is the name of this orchestra. So she, she actually got this amazing training with a with a with a sort of a legendary pianist, mm -hmm. uh, popular uh, uh, popular pianist. And at the same time, she entered the Alejandro Garcia Caturla Conservatory of Music, which was a, a, a conservatory that was actually created uh, by the revolution. And there, she studied with uh, a, a, also a legendary uh, Afro-Cuban pianist who had just came back from. Uh, from uh, studying in Europe, uh, Saint Ida Manfugas was her name. So she studied with her, and uh, at, in that conservatory, she also became friends with uh, with Paquito de Rivera, the, uh, mm -hmm. the famous uh, jazz player. Mm -hmm. um, and they played concerts where they actually used to jam and, and you know, improvise music together. Uh, one of the things that we don't really know a lot about uh, about Tani is that she is actually a great improviser. Uh, and it's, this is part of her compositional process, the fact that she improvises so well. So, so for, for Tanya, was she unusual uh, in that she had these opportunities or was this, uh, was this something that was available to all? I mean, I, I'm assuming that there was not a large middle class. Yeah, no, that's a good question. No, and, and her family was not a middle class family. It, it was a working class family. Mm -hmm. I have some pictures of... Uh, this is uh, on the, I guess, on my left, which is, I'm not sure, might be your right, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, those are the, uh, uh, Tania's grandparents, uh, Jose Leon and Rosa Julia de los Mederos. Mm -hmm. uh, um, her, uh, her grandfather was actually Chinese. Uh, and her grandmother was uh, a mixed race, uh, the daughter of, uh, of a Spanish uh, man and a, and a black woman. And, and these are her, uh, uh, her uh, parents, um, uh, Dora Ferran and uh, Oscar Leon. Uh, they were, it was a working class family. Mm -hmm. And, but very early, uh, uh, and this is quite, uh, it's very interesting about, especially about her grandmother. Her grandmother very early realized that she had a very good ear for music. Uh, she would like listen to the radio and start singing the songs and then start sort of uh, trying to imitate uh, 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 the, you know, the, the melodies and, uh, and all of that. So she actually brought her to, uh, to the School of Music very early when she was four. 
uh, she wanted her to get training in music theory, but she was too young, but uh, and they, they wouldn't take her. They said, well, she's too young, maybe wait another couple of years. But she was so insistent that they, they actually took her. So she started taking uh, piano lessons and music theory lessons when she was four years old wow. at this conservatory. And it was a big effort for the family because it was a private school. It was not something that's available to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. We have some pictures here of, of, of her practicing piano uh in around 1951 this piano was uh given to her by uh by her grandfather as a as a, as a gift but again with great efforts um uh, and it remained in her family for decades actually uh her her niece and her nephew learned to play a piano on this instrument uh, in the 1970s and in the 1980s so it, it remained in the family but you can see, I mean, you can see her face. She's so focused already at, at, at uh, you know, she yeah. was, she was uh, uh, seven, years, seven years old there now. Very serious. It's yeah. a very serious look that she's giving the camera. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so at some point she began to perform with others. Oh, here's her high school graduation. Yeah. Yeah, so um, she basically started performing with others after she graduated, uh, and uh, um, there was a moment uh, in the in the mid nineteen sixties uh, um, when she actually started composing, uh, playing uh, mostly popular music with he, uh, with her brother. Her brother was a, a violin player, and they put together a little band actually, and she started composing uh, songs for this band. Uh, and one of those songs actually became quite popular because it was uh, heard by uh, by a famous singer uh, whose name is uh, Elena Burke. Uh, she was a, a very famous uh, bolero singer, sort of love songs. Mm -hmm. uh, she heard this song and she actually uh, uh, sang it in a, in a recital. Uh, so this is one of the earlier uh, songs that she composed. It's called Ciego Reto, or Blind Challenge. Uh, and, and in this version, what's interesting is that um, in this version, uh, uh, Paquito de Rivera is playing it uh, in a uh, in a uh, jazz arrangement that he did um, in the nineteen in the in the nineteen sixty five. Actually, Paquito de Rivera and Tania played a concert together, and they played this piece. Mm. So this is sort of like a a, a a remake of that early version. So I'll play a little bit just so you get a sense of okay. uh, what the music sounds like. And I so keep in mind that this is. If this is popular music this is not the type of music that she would actually compose later but it gives you a sense of you know um her uh, melodic gift and also uh the kind of harmony that she likes <laughs> It feels very Cuban. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it is, it's interesting. Uh, I, I believe that the, early, the, the original version was, was meant to be a bossa nova. Uh -huh. But yeah, uh, Paquito de Rivera clearly made it, made it into a Cuban rendition here. <laughs> um, so, so at some point, she was experimenting with more modernist compositions with, was it like an artist collective? Um, 
Yeah, um, there was a um, sort of uh, young musicians who were involved with this new avant-garde scene that was uh, developing in uh, in Cuba. They started to get together, uh, and uh, some of them actually gained the support of the government. So, uh, and they started getting uh, uh, their music performed. Uh, so she was part of that uh, small circle of musicians who were interested in playing the music of uh, young composers. So she participated in a couple of those concerts, playing piano, solo piano pieces, premiering solo piano pieces by young uh, Cuban composers, but also chamber music. Uh, um, and I, it was at around that time uh, that uh, her teacher at this popular music seminary, uh, whose name was um, um, Edmundo, um, Alfredo Diez Nieto, perdon, I'm sorry. So Alfredo Diez Nieto and Harold Gramache, they were uh, uh, his uh, piano, his composition instructors at the seminary. So they asked her to start um, uh, composing pieces, basically as, you know, harmony exercises. Um, so those were the first pieces that, that she composed in sort of a more modern style, but still very influenced by that um, uh, generation of musicians that I mentioned before that were coming from a more neoclassical tradition. So you hear a lot of uh, Prokofiev in, that, in those early compositions, uh, a lot of Bartok, uh, Stravinsky, uh, but with a sort of a Cuban twist. Um, uh, also interesting that you hear a lot of Debussy too. <laughs> so they weren't a, it wasn't a countercultural sort of movement. Where were they performing, for instance? Well, uh, it, those those other people, they were. They were clearly oh. uh, an avant-garde experimental um, musicians. Uh, she was at that time, you know, she calls these pieces the, the pieces she composed when she was not a composer. She, she literally told me, you know, I was not a composer, but my, uh, my composition teachers asked me to do it and I did it and they liked it and they said, well, you might become a composer in the future. But they were real. They are really uh, sort of exercises on on harmony and and, and uh, piano writing. Mm -hmm. uh, they are actually they. Uh, she sort of went back to them for, for for many years. She didn't consider them part of her music catalog. But there's a new recording that's coming uh, that, that's going, that's uh, coming out soon of um, all of her piano works, mm -hmm. and she included those pieces. So you, you know those who are interested will should be actually able to listen to those those recordings um but yeah so her early efforts were not really uh part of you know trying to challenge the establishment or anything like that she was just you know trying to learn the craft of composition mm -hmm. it was a laboratory for her <laughs> exactly yeah so then at some point she decided she needed to go abroad yeah. mostly to study piano i guess right that's right that's right so it was around that time 1965 1966 that he, uh, that she, I'm sorry, decided that that she wanted to go abroad. Uh, she had actually uh, uh, approached the uh, the uh, um, the Cuban government to see if she could get a scholarship to go to Paris. She wanted to do you know, piano studies in Paris, uh, but there was no there was no way that the the, that the government would would actually uh, be able to give her a scholarship for that. So uh, at that time in 60, 65, 66, she, she decided that the only way for her to, to be, because they were also, as I mentioned, uh, their, their, her family was not rich. They didn't really have money. So the only way for her to leave was to uh, actually enroll in the uh, uh, Freedom Flight program, uh, which was uh, implemented uh, in what was 19... 65, I believe, by Lyndon B. Johnson and the Cuban government. So it was an air bridge uh, administered by both the Cuban and the, and the American government. Mm -hmm. So um, she applied and, and she got a, a visa to, uh, well, not visa, but a permit to leave the country and to, to travel to the United States. Uh, so in 1967, she leaves. She mm -hmm. left Cuba. Uh, and now the problem is that she was unaware that by going to Cuba through this program, she was actually relinquishing her Cuban citizenship. So she was basically trapped in, in the United States without, the, her passport was canceled when she left Cuba uh, and she couldn't leave the country. She, she arrived in, in Miami and then, you know, she arranged to be relocated in New York City uh, a few weeks after that. She ended up in New York City, but what she wanted to do really was to to be able to get out of Cuba and then to go to to France, and that that dream didn't happen. No? So she had to uh, 
uh, learn to uh, to live the life of an immigrant in the United States. And the others, the other folks who were leaving Cuba at that time, didn't have a lot of similarity with her. That's, they were motivated right. by other things, right? That's right, that's right. So yeah, uh, the early the early migration out of Cuba uh, in the 1960s were mostly the the rich elites who were threatened by the economic reforms of the of the Cuban Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, they were mostly, uh, as, as you can imagine, they were mostly white. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, she told me a story that, that uh, when she actually uh, uh, got into that plane that, that was taking her out of Cuba, she was the only black person. Um, and that uh, a Cuban uh, um, uh, officer, a black officer actually asked her, why are you leaving Cuba? Why are you as a black woman leaving Cuba when now things are changing for uh, uh, for uh, this, this change is going to be good for us. This was this is what they thought, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's right. Uh, what uh, she was not motivated by political reasons. Her her reasons to leave Cuba were uh, artistic reasons, professional mm -hmm. reasons. Um, did, did that make it difficult for her to find a community in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, she's always had a, a difficult. Uh, um, way of relating to the uh, to the Cuban American community uh, even with someone like Paquito de Rivera who were you know they were friends when, in Cuba and they played concerts together they did music together uh, but Paquito de Rivera was very anti uh, anti Castro uh, and he was quite militant and uh, um, and for that reason uh, um, he was also quite critical of this, the the fact that Tania wouldn't take a stance against the regime Mm -hmm. uh, but for for Tanya, it was um, it was very difficult because not only because she left for other reasons, but also because her entire family remained in Cuba, and she mm -hmm. knew that whatever she did uh, or say against the Cuban regime, uh, her family would feel the repercussions. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why she always uh, tried to avoid uh, speaking about politics, because she knew that her mom, her brother, they would actually. Uh, be targeted. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a black woman in Cuba, did she experience uh, racism or uh, oppression like um, yeah. you know, people would experience in other parts of the Americas? Yeah. No, uh, and this is quite interesting. So um, her parents, they lived in that uh, sort of very racially polarized society where uh, uh, Blacks were not allowed to go to certain places. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they met in one of these clubs for Black people. They, they were called Sociedades de Color, which is basically uh, uh, social clubs for, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for Black folks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but she didn't live that life. Uh, 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 that changed in the, in the 20th century, and it definitely uh, changed after the Cuban Revolution. But not only that, but um, her grandmother uh, and her mother made uh, a point that that trying to prevent her from experiencing uh, racial discrimination. So she she was very protected by by those two women when she was growing up. Um, and there was this this picture that I that I shared earlier with you uh, from mm -hmm. her high school graduation, which uh, is quite telling because you can uh, tell that um, maybe not in that particular picture. There's another one that maybe I should have shared. Where you can see she is the only black student in the lineup. Is that right? In that lineup, you can see that yeah. she's, the only, she's the only black student. But there's another picture from her uh, from her elementary school where there's uh, it, it really is an integrated classroom. Uh, mm -hmm. There's whites, there's there's blacks, there's mixed race. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so uh, yeah, what what she's told me that she didn't feel that experience, mm -hmm. uh, and that when she was actually. Uh, uh, when she decided to come to the United States, that her her grandmother was uh, very actively trying to dissuade her to come to the United States, mm -hmm. uh, and one of the reasons that that she gave her is that she was going to experience uh, racial discrimination uh, here that she hadn't experienced in 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 Cuba, uh, and uh, and that's true. When she came, she uh, she realized that um, what her grandmother had told her was actually right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, she came in 67 uh, to New York City, as I mentioned. She was very lucky that uh, very uh, that she got a, a scholarship to go to uh, to college, to music school. Um, uh, so she 
she joined the uh, uh, New York College of Music in 1967, um, literally a couple of months after she arrived uh, in the country uh, with a scholarship, uh, so she didn't have to pay. Uh, and uh, she did a couple of years before she graduated. I think she graduated in 71 or something like that with a bachelor's in piano. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically what, what that, uh, being in school at that moment, what, uh, what uh, did for her was to uh, give her the language. So mm -hmm. she came to the United States without knowing a word of English. Wow. Um, and uh, uh, so slowly she started learning the language. And in 1968, um, it, another uh, lucky uh, lucky moment for her, she was uh, replacing a pianist uh, um, uh, who was uh, accompanying uh, dance, ballet lessons, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, this uh, these lessons happened in the um, um, the Harlem School of the Arts, uh, and uh, at that moment was when uh, Arthur Mitchell was uh, in conversation with Dorothy Maynor to uh, create a, an, a, a, an African-American ballet company that was first housed uh, in the Harlem School of the Arts. And then later it became an independent thing and it became the Dance Theater of Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, Arthur Mitchell um, uh, met uh, uh, Tanya when she was playing this uh, for this for this ballet lessons. And um, uh, he liked the, what she was doing and uh, he invited her to be the 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 music uh director of the company the company that was still in the imagination of of, of mr mitchell mm -hmm. so was she she was improvising for the dancers that's right that's it probably right. took a lot of skill and probably played into her her um forte i suppose as someone who could improvise and compose through improvisation. That's right. That's right. And and this is actually what happened uh, uh, with the dance theater, dance theater of Harlem. Um, they would actually uh, they would ask her to uh, to improvise, and improvise sort of following what the what the uh, the dancers were doing, mm -hmm. uh, and sort of following the counting of the dancers. Uh, and she started doing that and more and more. And eventually, what she was doing in those rehearsals became her first composition which is Tones uh, from 1971. Uh, and uh, um, Arthur Mitchell said that that was the first uh, uh, ballet that he commissioned, that was uh, Tanya's, uh, Tanya's Tones. Uh, and that was sort of the turning moment um, uh, when she decided, OK, if I'm going to be composing, I also need to get a degree in composition or study, uh, formally study composition. So she en enrolled uh, again in, uh, uh, well, it was no longer the New York College of Music. It had already been absorbed by, a by NYU. So mm -hmm. she enrolled in NYU and she got a degree in, in composition uh, in um, 1975. So that those early years in the 19 in the 1970s, when she's composing a lot for the for the company and studying, are really the moment in which she decides, okay, I'm no longer going to be a pianist. I'm going to be a composer and eventually also a conductor because she's sort of basically was uh, thrown into the <laughs> into the pit by Arthur Mitchell and Giancarlo Menotti actually. Mm -hmm. uh, they she were... had to learn the tools. <laughs> yeah, she had to learn it right away. Uh -huh. uh, by doing it. So do you have do you have any uh, samples of her music from that period? Yeah, so there's some pictures. Oh, yeah, there. Of Harlem uh, conducting the orchestra, which was a, a, eventually an, an integrated orchestra that, that she put mm -hmm. together. Uh, and there's uh, uh, the company. Uh, she's right in the middle between uh, Carol Shug and Arthur Mitchell. Uh, and the other picture is a uh, picture of a recording, the recording of tones, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, early the company, in, early in the sort of the life of the company, what they would do is they would uh, record music and then rehearse with the music, and then they also perform with the with the recorded music mm -hmm. uh, until that that moment in uh, uh, in Spoleto when uh, Giancarlo Menotti asked her to conduct the orchestra. Uh, so after that, the, the idea was, okay, let's actually have an orchestra, let's have a school of music. And she became not only the conductor of the orchestra and the accompanist of the rehearsals, but also the director of the school of music that they had. So uh, yeah, 
her life over maybe 12 years or so, up until 1980, when she left the Dance Theater of Harlem, revolved basically around the activities of Dance Theater of Harlem. So really around this uh, African-American sort of legendary uh, ballet company. Mm -hmm. um, I have a piece of music. Um, this is a really interesting picture from the nineteen, from the early nineteen seventies. Mm -hmm. So all of that moment, uh, early nineteen seventies, she couldn't go back to Cuba because uh, uh, she didn't have a passport first. And then when she actually got American citizenship and she got an American passport, there was no way there, the, that that uh, you know the, uh, there was no agreement for Americans to go to Cuba. So it took her. Um, uh, what was it, almost 11 years, 12 years before she could go back to Cuba. And they were very, very stressful years for her. So I like these two pictures uh, because they're basically sort of the same picture, but her, her expression is completely different. Uh, and I asked her, you know, why is it that you look so sad in that picture? And then, you know, she said, well, I was, I was uh, very sad in my life. She said that she's wearing a wig because she was actually losing, losing her hair out of the, uh, the uh -huh. stress. Uh, of not being able to be with her family, not being able to communicate with, with her mother. Uh, her grandmother died uh, early in the 1970s. Um, uh, she was having you know, problems trying basically to, uh, to, ma to make a living, right? Um, so for her, Dance Theater of Harlem was not only this job, but it also became sort of like a, a, a family you know, uh, for her to, uh, to feel protected. So, um, so I like this to picture because uh, uh, the, the the photographer asked her, so why don't you smile a little bit? So the second picture is sort of the is the one that's trying to hide, you no, know, what what's really going on, what you can see in the first picture. Yeah, yeah. So this is a piece, uh, a ballet that that, that she composed for uh, Dance Theater of Harlem in 1973. It's haiku, and this is from her early work, uh, uh, sort of trying to become a part of the avant-garde scene in uh, in New York City at the time. Uh, so you will not hear any of the references that you, that you hear later to Afro-Cuban music or any of that. But this was actually trying to really become part of that scene. It was a scene that was very modernist, very avant-garde, and references to local culture were not necessarily encouraged, right? So this is what her music sounded like back then. There in the watercolor of the water moves translucent fishes. stop it without I didn't want to stop it but oh, oh. <laughs> I have enough music to cover so uh, I mean so that's all right. you know some more samples um yeah so how did she what brought her to Tanglewood I I noticed you've got this photo up yeah so uh conducting lessons uh she wanted to uh uh she had she was already conducting as I mentioned uh, in 71 she started conducting um the orchestra of the of the uh of the company um, in when was it in 1978 that year uh, she was invited to uh, conduct in Broadway actually uh, she was conducting uh, uh, the Wiz mm -hmm. um, so she did that for a couple of years I believe and uh, that was the first year when she started uh, uh, conducting the orchestra there and she realized that she ne really needed to get conducting lessons so as soon as the, the Broadway season was over, um, she went to Tangalu, she enrolled in, uh, in, in that uh, uh, um, worship and studied with Bernstein and with uh, Seiji Osawa. Mm -hmm. So those were her, um, her main uh, uh, conducting uh, 
uh, teachers, although she had studied with other conductors earlier in, through, through the early 1970s. Uh, but that was also a very important one because um, that's also, uh, um, she had started working with the Brooklyn Philharmonic in 1976. So she really needed to solidify the, the, the technique as, as a conductor. Um, with the Brooklyn Philharmonic, she was invited by Lucas Foss um, to uh, create the uh, community concert series, uh, which was actually, I believe, one of the first of its uh, of its uh, kind in um, in the uh, classical music scene in in the United States. So what they were doing it was uh, it was Tania Leon, it was uh, Julius Eastman, it was Talibra Hakim. So that trio organized. Uh, 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 concerts in um, in the community, uh, in schools, in uh, um, in I believe in jails, in parks, and uh, they championed the music of people of color. Uh, first, uh, African American composers, but then African American, Latinos, Asian Americans, especially when uh, Tanya took over the series uh, around 78, 78, 79, it really became her series. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really an important moment you know, for her. She uh, uh, solidifies the technique and then she actually starts doing very important work. So, so she did she identify with, with um, the black community at that point or, or still did she feel, uh, did she identify herself more as a Cuban American or how, how did that play out for her? Yeah, so that, you know, that's a very difficult question uh, because she doesn't identify as anything. So when I was actually started, when I started writing the book and the first draft that I gave her to read, I, uh, I spoke about her in, as an African-American woman or Afro-Cuban woman. I don't remember exactly how I, I described the situation. But she replied right away and, and told me, I don't want you to call me an African-American woman. I don't want you to call me uh, uh, an Afro-Cuban woman. I don't want you to call me a female composer. Uh, so she, uh, uh, she very clearly stated that she didn't care for those labels. And, and this has been very, uh, I, I think that this has created a lot of um, uh, misunderstandings, especially with the African-American community. Mm -hmm. Um, that she doesn't want to use the label, even though she grew up uh, as an artist, she grew up in the African-American community with Dance Theater of Harlem, with Alvin Ailey, uh, and doing, you know, Broadway, The Wiz, uh, and, uh, and later in, in, in her life, she's always been connected to the African-American and the Latino communities. But uh, what, what uh, people who, uh, who get upset with, with her stance don't understand is that uh, for her being identified as Afro-Cuban or uh, African-American or Chinese-Cuban, or it's just, uh, it, that's just one part of her heritage. And, and she's always told me, if you call me an Afro-Cuban, then what happens with my Chinese uh, background? And what happens with my uh, uh, Spanish background? Uh, or if you call me um, a, uh, an African-American, that's what happens with this other part of my life. So it is more about the fact that she feels that when you label her, you fragment her, uh, mm -hmm. and in a way you do violence to how she feels about herself, uh, 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 her self-identity, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and that is always incomplete. You know? I think this is really the main reason that it is incomplete, that doesn't really tell you much about how, how she is uh, as a human being. And that's really for her, that's the most important thing. You know? um, and for her, that, that comes out in her music. Mm -hmm. what, did, what does she do after this period? Um, does, she, does she continue composing or conducting or both? Um, yeah, how did she progress yeah. from here? So 1979, that's the year that she was able to go back to Cuba. Uh, and that was also a, a year that changed her uh, outlook on, on her musical craft. Uh, she met her, her father with whom she had a very difficult relationship. She was an absent father most of her life. 
and uh, uh, so they they uh, got together and they um, traveled during those days that she was in Cuba. So they got to get uh, to know each other better. Uh, and at some point, um, her father asked her uh, when when she played her music to him. Her father asked her, "So this is very nice. This is this all sounds very good. But where are you? Where are you in this music?" Hmm. And, and she said that at that moment she didn't really understand what 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 uh, her father wanted to tell her. Um, but she also said that they went to uh, gatherings of Afro-Cuban music. Um, that um, you know, Afro-Cuban music is very present in in Havana. You you know you walk through a neighborhood that you would feel you would hear. Uh, people playing the the drums and playing rumba and playing uh, or playing drum um, drum music that's related to Santeria, you know, the the, the mm-hmm. Afro-Cuban religion. So uh, and she had grown up with this music. Uh, um, uh, um, she was not a practicing uh, uh, Santera, or she was not never actually a um, a member of the religion. But the music is always there in Cuba, and so she grew up listening to this music. And when she back in, she, when she was back in, in Cuba in 1979, this music all and all of these memories came back to her. Mm. Uh, and uh, so uh, she came back to the United States and started asking the, the the question of, okay, so what is all of this that I that that was part of my life, uh, and I have somehow uh, rendered invisible, right? Uh, so uh, she started composing music that um, tried to incorporate some of these elements, uh, especially rhythmic elements and rhythmic notions, ideas about rhythm that come from um, from uh, African music from Cuba and from Cuban music in general. Um, and but also she started thinking about her family, mm-hmm. uh, especially because uh, her father died the following year. Mm-hmm. Um, so they had this moment after a very difficult relationship. They had this moment when they were getting together, sort of back getting together, and then he died. No? So she's always felt that this was uh, somehow unfair. No? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And that's reflected in some of the music that she composed right away. So Bata from 1985 uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is a piece that's based, uh, basically an, uh, an homage to her father mm-hmm. uh, and to how she felt about her father. Mm-hmm. So you hear at the very beginning of the, of the piece, I'm just going to play the very, very beginning, but you hear, you hear this little um, um, melody on the flute. And that melody is actually her father whistling. This is how her father whistled when she arrived home, when he arrived home, whenever he arrived home. Uh, and, uh, but he, she said that he would always leave. No? Mm-hmm. So this is what the piece is about. Really, it's about her father coming in and out of her life. So I'll play it just a little bit so that you you get a sense of this new kind of music that she's doing. Started uh, that she started composing in uh, uh, in the 1980s after that visit to Cuba.
Yeah, so mm -hmm. you, you hear that little that little melody throughout the composition, and it comes back at the very very end. That that's how the the the, the composition ends with that. Mm -hmm. And and when I was I was listening to this piece with uh, with her, and she was telling me, you know, how the things that she felt were important in the piece, mm -hmm. and at the very end she was joking, yeah, that's my father. She always left, and mm -hmm. that was the last time. But that. She, that way, that time he was living in a different way, you know, like he was, he died. No? Mm -hmm. Would you, would you say that um, her work tends to be in general programmatic, telling a story? I think that, yeah, um, especially most of the later pieces tell a story. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're not, uh, not programmatic in that, you know, the form doesn't necessarily follow, uh, follow a, a program, follow a story or follow a, mm -hmm. follows a plot. But there's always a story behind that's for sure mm -hmm. um uh uh the, um yeah we can talk a little bit more about that when we when we talk about stride so the, the piece that that won her the pulitzer prize but i want to play, play something from uh, also from 89 this is a piece called bate uh mm -hmm. that she uh, co-composed with michelle camillo the jazz player Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I wanted to play it because it gives you uh, sort of a, it opens the the, uh, the perspective of what you know what is it that that Tanya does with music because this is completely different from anything that we've heard before, and here you have the uh, the African drums and the uh, and the African rhythms, uh, and you start here it is it's for choir and and percussion, and you the, and the um, the language that they use is um, she said that they invented a language. Because mm -hmm. so, bate is the uh, those were the spaces where um, the um, um, the African communities in the Caribbean would actually escape. So they were like um, um, uh, communities of escaped slaves, mm -hmm. uh, and many of these slaves came from different uh, places of, of Africa. They didn't speak the same language, so they actually started sort of creating these midget, uh, midget kind of languages. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 combining, you know, Spanish with their own language and the language of their, uh, you know, their friends there. Uh, so this is what they did. Uh, they came up with a language that was an invention, mm -hmm. uh, and they played it to. Uh, so they said the, the 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 lyrics to to this music that's very very different from from what we've heard before. So I'll play just a little bit so you get a sense of this. Mm -hmm.
Douglas Batei. Wonderful, really atmospheric and and amazing. Yeah, and and really, what she was trying to do here was to it was a synthesis of many of the the music that had um, influenced her throughout her life. So there's uh, music from Africa, elements from Africa, music from Cuba, uh, elements of jazz to uh, African American music. So she's putting all of this together in this in this new piece. Mm. So what are we seeing here in this photo? So this is Wallace Oyinka, Tanya, and Henry Lou Gates Jr. And this refers to uh, the composing of her first opera, uh, mm -hmm. Scorch of Hyacinths, which is based on a, a, a radio play by uh, the Nobel Prize uh, uh, winner Wallace Oyinka. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Tanya wanted to uh, uh, compose an opera because uh, Hans Werner Hensley invited her to compose an opera uh, for the uh, for the Munich uh, Biennale, mm -hmm. and um, she was uh, she was friends with her, uh, Henry Louis Gates, and uh, Henry Louis Gates said, "Well, why don't you um, why don't you think about uh, Wallace Oyinka and, and this particular opera, which is about a um, a political prisoner." Uh, in um, uh, in Lagos, mm -hmm. and um, um, the uh, it's a, it's an opera that's very political that speaks about the, about human rights and it's about uh, this person who is uh, basically sentenced to death for, for something that he didn't do, you know? mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, and he comp uh, and she composes this this opera in which she goes back to many of these music that that she had grown up as a, a as a kid, especially Afro-Cuban uh, um, Yoruba traditions uh, um, uh, that come out of the religion of Santeria. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the most uh, famous arias from that opera is uh, Oye Manja. Uh, so it's the, the, uh, the mother of the, the character that's going to be sent to, uh, to uh, sentenced to death. Uh, uh, praise to Oye Manja, one of the main uh, goddesses of the Yoruba tradition. Um, and uh, and she, when she learned what the plot what of the of the play was about, she said that she felt so compelled because she, she said that well, these goddesses of of the Yoruba tradition are actually the same goddesses that uh, my grandmother was uh, was invoking in in her uh, in her uh, spiritual uh, 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 moments uh, and, uh, and in her religion in Santeria, no? it's just the Cuban version of those of those uh, African deities. Mm. Uh, so she decided to uh, to compose this this uh, aria, and she composed one. She composed the aria when her fam her mother came to visit her in the in the United States. Oh, wow! And so she tells me that her mother was actually remembering. Some of the songs that she would uh, that she would sing in in, in some of these uh, religious rituals, uh, and that it, that was the inspiration to compose this piece. So maybe I can just play a little bit. I'm going to play towards the towards the middle of it because there's a large piano introduction, mm -hmm. and I, I want to I want to actually uh, I want you to listen to the to the soprano, which actually is done option. Oh! 
uh, heavenly. Yeah, such a beautiful, such a beautiful area. Yeah. Well, I hope I hope before the night is over, you might um, you might send us a listening list, maybe. Sure. If you'd like to listen more. Um, I also want to mention to anyone who's with us this evening that you should feel free to text in any questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to those. Um, but it's all right if you don't. We have plenty to talk about uh, to end the program. Um, so, so I don't know, are we ready to go on to uh, Tanya as an educator or, or shall we, shall we um, talk about her Pulitzer and and um yeah well the, the pulitzer is, is also a really interesting story um uh, i should maybe uh give you an introduction of uh she in the 19 uh in the 1990s 1993 uh she became composer of in residence with the new york philharmonic uh and was there for three years uh, uh under court masseur was the conductor of the orchestra back then and she also uh, started working with the uh, American Composers Orchestra in a um, in a multi-annual uh, festival that was called Sonido de las Americas, the Sounds of the Americas, in which she presented music from Mexico. One year was about Mexico, another year was about Argentina, another year was about Puerto Rico, another year was about Venezuela, and the last year was about Cuba. Um, and she brought uh, musicians and composers from Cuba and put them together in the same place, in the same concerts and in the same sort of spaces with Cuban Americans who were uh, uh, musicians uh, uh, active in the in the uh, United States uh, uh, music scene who hadn't seen each other for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a, it was an amazing moment. So she was already sort of um, becoming more of a cultural broker in the in the 1990s. Um, and uh, uh, but the, that particular uh, partnership with the New York Philharmonic didn't work out very well. Uh, there was a big scandal because um, they basically had her um, organizing uh, scores and basically cleaning up these storage rooms, and they never sure. actually they never allowed her to uh, they allowed her to com to conduct the orchestra once in a concert of Spanish music, I believe. Uh, uh, so it was a chamber version of the of the Philharmonic, and um, and they never commissioned anything from her. So there was a big scandal in the New York Times. You know, there was someone who was writing about you know why do you have a composer in residence if you don't if you don't uh, you don't ask her to compose anything for you. Mm -hmm. um, so it didn't end up very very well. But what's really interesting is that um, literally what um, almost thirty years later um they invite her to to compose stride as part of um, this larger project of the new philharmonic uh, celebrating the 19th amendment right mm -hmm. uh, so the celebration was um to commission 19 women to compose 19 pieces for the philharmonic uh, and she composed stride uh in honor of uh susan b anthony but also in honor of um her mother and her grandmother uh, and stride really is about that sort of that walk, determined walk in life. You know, you know where you're going, and you're going, you or you're gonna get there regardless of. Just like as you know, uh, Susan Bean Anthony, uh, uh, so focus on 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 getting a uh, uh, voting right for women, right? She mm -hmm. felt okay. My my mom and my grandmother, they they lived this life, and they they did everything they they could for me to actually become what I have become. Um, so um, th that's what the composition is about. It's about honoring those those three female figures in her life. But what's really interesting about the piece too is that at the uh, uh, at the very end, you, when you have the big fanfare, the big celebration uh, with the bells and everything, you start hearing this uh, this uh, um, African uh, rhythm, uh, an African instrument that's sort of in the background, sort of like a playing playing this uh, repeated rhythmic pattern. Uh, and what that rhythmic pattern actually symbolizes is the fact that uh, that um, African American women uh, found all difficulties to actually exercise their right to vote, and it was not until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that they could actually exercise the right of, of voting. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is also again a very political piece, 
it, it doesn't come across that way because you know again the program is not blatant and it's not in your face but if you know and, and uh, uh, if you you know if you have a chance to to hear her speak about that piece you will you will understand that okay that drum at the end is reminding us not everyone got the rights and there were people who were still left behind mm -hmm. uh, and those people actually were african-american women mm -hmm. uh, so i think it's a very very powerful powerful statement uh, and about um, her interest in african-american culture and in african-american people uh, and in african-american history uh, regardless of you know the fact that she doesn't want to use that label no mm -hmm. she is completely invested in in, in those communities no? mm -hmm. That's very interesting that yep. she, she had come to know and appreciate the struggles of those in her new country. Yeah, but yeah. Th and this is one of the things that I argue in the book is that she, she came to understand because she this is how she became an American. She mm -hmm. became an American through experiencing the same discrimination that African Americans were experiencing mm -hmm. um, uh, in the, uh, in, you know, in the workplace in the uh, uh in the in her every everyday life mm -hmm. uh, and in her interaction with just regular folks so mm -hmm. um yeah yeah so uh and also the, the reason why i mentioned i was mentioning the earlier connection with the new york philharmonic is because i asked her so this project is about female composers you no know, how come you want to do this one mm -hmm. I, you know with this issue that she doesn't want to be identified as a, as a female composer right right and she said, "It is about uh, it is about reparations." Mm -hmm. So huh. it was very powerful because it was, yeah, something happened thirty years ago with this orchestra, right? Yeah. And now it's uh, now it's time that you recognize my my value as an artist, mm -hmm. which is undeniable. Her value as an artist, you yeah. know. So it's a shame that they didn't recognize it sooner. Yeah. Um, so we have we have a question in the chat from Hillary Cumming. Uh, she says she is an she accomplished so much in her day in her life. Did she have a family in the United States that she had to balance with this incredible work ethic? No, no, she didn't have anyone. Nobody. She didn't have anyone. At some point, uh, her nephew was a cultural attache uh, of uh, in the Cuban. Uh, uh, it's not an embassy, it's uh, the Office of uh, Cuban Interests in New York City. Mm -hmm. So uh, at some point he was in New York City uh, when she was in New York City. But uh, she tells me that because she was because he was working for the Cuban government that uh, they were not really allowed to get together. So they would go. Uh, it, this sounds like a really like a like a spy story, like a spy. <laughs> history. Like they would go to this uh, uh, place in the countryside where they would just meet and talk a little bit, and then they would go their separate ways. <laughs> Weird. So her, yeah, she didn't have any, any relatives in the United States. So her community of artists became her family. Okay. Um, and students, I imagine, also, who benefited greatly from her. That's can right. You, yeah. yeah can, can you talk I, about her as an educator a little? Well, yeah, that that's really interesting that every every single student and, uh, and former advisee that I talked to, they all say the same thing. Like, I mean, she was an amazing teacher. She We learned so much about her, but she was also family. And this story mm -hmm. I heard from I, literally from everyone uh, that, that she got an, a personal interest in them and they, she would call their uh, their their mother their parents they uh, uh, she would make sure that you know that that the the parents knew what the what the kids were doing uh that, that they knew that what they were doing had value and she tried to actually sort of uh, advocate for them uh um there was someone who told me about uh actually uh, tanya going out of her way to try to uh uh process her visa actually um so uh and that sort of happened with me actually uh, i knew tanya from before uh but mm -hmm. i was writing the you know doing the research and interviewing her and going you know to to uh, her house she also got to know my 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 daughter and my wife and my mom actually uh, <laughs> and to me really she became almost like family mm -hmm. so um that that's sort of the way that she advocates for uh for for her students, it's 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 more than what what you would you would see normally, 
-hmm. from a mentor. It's 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 much more than that. No? It's really personal for her. Mm -hmm. Does she continue to teach? She was at Brooklyn College. Was at Brooklyn College and at mm -hmm. CUNY. Um, no, she retired uh, and she's now emeritus, I think. Mm -hmm. Brooklyn College. Uh, they had this big celebration of her at Brooklyn College last week. Oh wow! Yeah, it would have been nice to have seen, especially you know preparing for this. Yeah, yeah. So no, she she doesn't teach anymore and. I mean, she's very busy, especially after the Pulitzer, like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we invited her at, at, to Cornell to teach a master class and to present her work. And it was really difficult to just plan it because she was, her agenda was busy and it was completely, <laughs> completely full. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants her now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, it is 8.13. And um, do you have any, any um, ending or, or summary things you'd like like us to know about her before before we finish tonight no well the, the only thing i would say is that um the process of writing the, the 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 biography was a difficult one for me because i wanted to sort of uh i didn't want to just celebrate her right mm -hmm. i wanted to be sort of uh, to have a critical uh, uh perspective uh, but it was so difficult because the more I knew about her, the more I knew about these experiences with advisees and, 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 and with former men, uh, mentees and uh, with her relationship with the different communities that she's been a part of, the more I actually admire her. Mm -hmm. So um, the, what I would say is get to know her, get to know her music. She is really, really an, an amazing uh, talent and, and, and a great human being. Mm. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Um, if you if you uh, want to give me an email of, of some a listening list, we'll post it on our website. So for those of you who are here uh, tonight who'd like to uh, explore some more, you can. And I have to say your book is marvelous. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Alejandro. Thank yeah. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Thank, um, you. thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you, everyone who's, be, who's here. And uh, it was it was a pleasure. And I'll send you an email with the playlist uh, later tonight. No? Oh, perfect. Perfect. Have a good evening. You Have too. a good thank evening, everybody. And um, we'll see you next year. <laughs>